we need to understand what God has given us in this nation. And now was the time to stand up. Now is the time to pray and then obey. But we have to know our history. We have to know where it came from. In history, you have two trains of thought. You have the train of thought of the right of kings. That kings were ordained of God. And that kings could do anything they wanted to because they were kings. Kings couldn't do anything wrong. And the king just passed on to pass on. Laws didn't matter to a king. But about seven or 800 years ago, that was being challenged. By the way, it was challenged in Scripture. How do we know it was challenged in Scripture? Because the concept that a king is not held accountable is not scriptural. Now you, ah, boy, I'm, gonna, I'm so far off the notes. So don't work. At, don't look at your notes for a little while. <laughs> um, was there ever a king in Israel that didn't follow the rules? I mean, oh, they all didn't, but there was one, and he had a son named Solomon. But Solomon was his second son. Because his first son died. Because he took another man's wife. Now in Israel they said, that, a no-no. The the rule in Israel, that's a no-no. But the king tried to hide it, so he had the other guy killed. Are we still on the same story to you that went to Sunday school? Okay. Okay. Uriah is listed as one of David's 33 great warriors. Uriah comes home. J. David finds out that he's had an affair with Bathsheba. She's pregnant. David says, oh, man. Quick, have Uriah come home from the war, and I'll send him home. Well, Uriah had more character than that. He says, no, I'm not sleeping with my wife. The rest of my men are out in battle. I'll sleep on my doorstep. So that didn't work for David. So then David wrote some orders. He sealed them, put a wax seal on them. He says, go hand these to your commander. So he runs and he hands them to his commander. And the commander opens them up and he says, dear commander, put Uriah right up front underneath the fortress. Make sure you got a good battle brewing. Then run away and leave him there by himself. And that's what the commander did, and Uriah died. The baby died. But then along the time before the baby dies, David thinks he's got away with it. Everybody knows the story. Who's the prophet that came in? Nathan comes in, and he says, let me tell you a story, king. Man, there's this huge baron. He's got hundreds of thousands of sheep. He's got everything. He's got everything in the world. But he's got this neighbor. He's only got one sheep. And it's just a little tiny lamb. It's cute as a little lamb. The lamb lives in the house with him, in fact. The children feed the lamb from the food off their table. I mean, this this, this lamb is is just a family pet. It's all they've got. And David's getting worked up. And he says, well, this, this rich guy with thousands and thousands of sheep, he's got company coming. So he goes out. And he steals the guy's lamb and slaughters it for his company. David jumps up off his throne. He says, we're going to kill that guy. We're going to kill that guy. Who is that guy? And Nathan says, that be you. And David repented, and God forgave him. The baby died. I mean, we won't get into that. But the reality is, even in the Bible, kings are not above the law. When you get into England and you get into Scotland and France and you get into the Romans and all the rest, kings are above the law. In fact, you you go to the Romans, they are the God. You go to Louis XIV, he's the sun God, longest reigning king of France. So we're going to look at the difference between what, what, what we call the right of kings and what we see in the Constitution or actually we see it in the Declaration of Independence, the rights of man, the natural rights. When in the course of human events, 
it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which they have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To that, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Uh, do, do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that under the natural law of God, under the way God does it, we have natural rights. And we are governed by people that we choose. Did, did Moses' father-in-law tell him to do anything? To pick out men to judge? In Israel, did they pick out men to judge? Did they choose? Yes, they did. That's exactly how it went. And that's how our nation in the natural law of God is intended. That's how far that goes back, the rights of men. So we choose and we submit to those that we choose as long as they are obedient to their station and to their responsibilities and calling. Again, this is not intended to be a solitary debate to start a rebellion. It's a study to reclaim our history we are not here to whip up an armed revolution. We need a revolution of the mind and a revival of our hearts and in the streets for America. People need to know we are failing as Christians to be stewards of the blessings that God has given us. I am so disappointed when I hear Christians say, well, I'm just not going to get involved. I'm not to say this is scriptural, but I believe it with all my heart that we will give an account before God for not getting involved. Okay. Okay, that's the declaration. Um, just quickly, I'm going to do it. I, I wasn't quite sure how to get started, and I certainly didn't get started the, right, the way I thought. Um, how many of you have ever read the Constitution? Okay. You want to talk about boring? It's absolutely boring. There's only 12 articles in it with sub-articles. And all it does is delineate the responsibilities, the powers of the government. The federal government. Remember at the end it says all rights and all duties not in here go to the states. We have so far blown by that that we need to get back to that. We're not going to study that much because it just tells us how it breaks down, what we're supposed to be doing. Now, what's interesting, and, and we talked about this in our study a year ago, is the Constitution was not going to get passed. And by the way, we had a charter for four years. We were a nation for four years as a charter. We didn't have a Constitution. Why did we need a Constitution? Because states were making their own deals with other nations, and we couldn't enforce anything. So we needed a constitution to pull us together to have some authority at a federal level. But you've got to understand, these people who were our founding fathers and mothers, and by the way, I can read you page after page after page of women who wrote and participated in the revolution and in the Constitution. Abigail Adams was a genius, probably smarter than her husband. He didn't pin anything. He didn't run by her first. You have numbers of women. Uh, that we, we all think of the Tea Party, right? The Tea Party? We all remember the Tea Party. You know, whoa, Tea Party. Started by a bunch of guys dressing up. No, the Tea Party was started by ladies. 
It took a lady in Boston and got a hundred of her friends, and they said, if you're going to charge us for tea, none of us are drinking tea. So they signed their name on the letter. They sent it to the King of England and said, no more tea parties at our house. Now, you go another year, and you, and, and by the way, these ladies never buckled. They never buckled. And you go another year, and then you have the guys decide to do something. But a lot of things within the revolution, we discount, unfortunately, how many women were imperative and important in what was going on at the time. So we have to have a constitution. We got this new nation. We got problems because nobody's respecting us. I, 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 didn't, I, I may read later some of the quotes of some of the people as they came and said, why we have to have a federal government. We didn't want a federal government because we knew what England was like. Power corrupts and, ab and absolute power corrupts absolutely. They didn't want that. They knew the, the, the evil in a human's heart is most corrupt. These were biblical people. And by the way, we were, if you think America was not started by born-again Christians, you need to pick up the last series. Okay, I won't go over it all again. But <clears throat> anybody who says that is not honest or has not studied so they said, okay, we're going to make this constitution. We're going to make it very limited. That, here is the constitution to the United States. You'd think it'd be so thick. No, no, no. It's very limited because they wanted a very limited government. And then even after they did that, they said, we still don't trust them. We still don't trust you guys. So we're going to start with what's called the Bill of Rights or the Ten Amendments. Because the Ten Amendments are there to restrict the government. Not to restrict us. So we'll get into that later. But anyway, so these are the Bill of Rights. Now there's now 20. How many Bill of Rights are there? How many? How many? Because they have amendments. 20 what? 27. Oh, by the way, I didn't bring that book. I have a little booklet. It's real old. Like me. But... Uh, Oh, here it is. This has all the original constitution, all the original noting, but it has all the amendments that were proposed and failed. You'll hear people say that the Constitution, why that's just a uh, uh, you know, piece of paper written by 200-year-old white guys. No, not at all. No, forget it. No, no. It's written, there's hundreds of years that the, the thoughts have come through, thousands of years. And, and by the way, it, we need to redo. You can, by the way, do you realize you can redo the Constitution? You want to change the Constitution? You can change the Constitution. It's called by an amendment. They put it in there so if they needed to do something, <coughs> they change it. Now, we've made 17 amendments to the Constitution since... We first, December 15th, wonderful day. <coughs> Roger Lasko because he knows it's my birthday. And, and uh, I was there, 18, 1787, <coughs> when they passed it. But the thing is, being good stewards of our God-given rights and responsibilities, we need to know what the amendments, the Constitution <coughs> excuse me, in the Declaration of Independence, declare. And then we need to stand up for it. Because if you think C-14 is not heading for America, it is. It is. It's coming. And by the way, I said earlier, we, we joked about it, I'd be in jail. Because I had a daughter that said, well, I'm gay. I said, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. And... We love you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Spent her own life into a tizzy for a while. Told her she couldn't bring any of her friends into the house. But you know what we told her? We love you. We love you and God loves you. And what you're doing is not God's plans. But we love you anyway. 
Well, no, 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 don't tell me. You're not. You're not. We love you. You're not. One of the first books I was going to write was going to be, what do you, what's a pastor do when his kid comes up and say they're gay? What you do is say we love you. Yeah. By the way, oh boy, I shouldn't go down this road too far. Well, it's one of the things we need to stand up for. We got teachers, especially coaches, that are grooming kids. Grooming them. Giving them special attention. Telling them. These kids look up to these people. They respect these people. And these people are used by the demons to turn the kids from what God intended. I think it's time, you know, we stand up. Anyways, get off your soapbox, Greg. Okay. Where's my notes? Here we go. We are now ready to start. The Bible, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and our responsibilities. Does power flow from the deity, God, to the rulers and then to the people, as ancient medieval and post-Renaissance monarchs claimed? Or does power flow from the deity, God, to the people and then to the rulers, as America's founders claimed? It's called the laws of nature, the laws of God. We're dealing with two things in history. Uh, anybody ever heard of this couple? Will and Ariel Durant, Pulitzer Prize winning historians, wrote the book, The Story of the Civilizations. It's 11 volumes. It took them 40 years. To publish them. They are both doctorates. They are scholars. They examined every major world civilization. They examined its rising, its flourishing, and its falling. And I believe one of the most strident factual principles that they came from their lifetime of scholarly research and observation is this. A great civilization, this is what they said, out of all the great civilizations they studied over their lifetime. A great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself from within. If we do not rise up and take what we are biblically stewards of, that's our rights, and our freedoms that God has given us and blessed us with in this nation. We will destroy our own nation. Canada is falling apart at the seams. We see it time and again. It's coming here if we don't rise up. I'm not talking pitchforks and torches. I'm talking understanding and getting involved in your community and voting. Everyone here should vote. Abso vote however you want to vote. I'll give a sermon in the fall about voting biblically. But we need to be voting. We need to be campaigning. We need to be supporting. We need to be vocal. We have a right to petition. We're going to look at some of the rights we're not using. And because the rights we're not using, we're being steamrolled by the demons. And oh, I'm not I'm just a shy person. I don't do this. I'm not asking that you run out and march. I'm asking maybe you support that somebody else that does. Okay. A great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself with within. The reason I'm doing this research, I'm just going to read, you can follow along. This research, study, and presentation is that I believe that all too many of us who identify as Christians in the United States of America are faltering in our duties in 
being good stewards of our God-given rights and responsibilities. I don't know about you, but I believe with all my heart we've been given the privilege to live in this nation. And at the privilege of living in this nation, we have rights. And if we allow them to just be washed away, we're not good stewards. We know the parable of the God, the master came and he said, okay, you get 10, you get five, you get one. They all take them and go off. The one guy, this is what always used to bug me about the one. He didn't lose it. He didn't waste it. He just buried it. And he brought it right back to the master. Master giving him. And I always thought it was so unfair because that's not fair. He gave you back exactly what you gave him. But Jesus says, the master says, you worthless, lazy, unprofitable servant. Take it away from him. Give it to the one with ten and throw him out where gnashing and death and teeth. Gnashing of teeth. Wait a second. You mean God's not going to be happy if I sit on my bum and just don't do anything? No, that, that, that's, all I'm saying is, look at that parable and recognize that that person did nothing what many Christians would think was wrong. He just took care of it. He didn't do anything, didn't try, didn't lose it. He just brought it back. We've been given an opportunity to live in this great nation, this nation that has sent more missionaries around than any other nation in the world and built more. I mean, I want to go on about the things we can talk about that God has called this nation to do for the world. And we should not allow ourselves to lose it by being bumps on a log. No. <clears throat> okay? 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Let a person, by the way, this is a politically correct reading of the word of God. Because if you're reading along, it says man. <laughs> Let a person so consider us as stewards of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Jesus taught more than one parable about the giving of talents, money, gifts, ability, responsibilities, authority to servants from the master to steward while the master was away. And in every parable, there was an accounting given at the end of the parable. In Luke 19, another parable. So he called ten of his servants, delivered them to ten minus. That would be amounts of money. And he said to them, do business till I come. Again, Jesus is going to tell us, do business till I come. What are we doing? Are we just existing? Or are we actually witnessing and loving people to the Lord? Are we doing God's business? So we can... See, I believe that God's business is all its all politics. I'm not that person that says, oh, no, you can't mix politics and Christianity. Oh, yes, I can. Christianity is my life of Christ is everything that I am. It's everything that I am. And it has to be invested into everything that I do. I don't segregate or separate myself into parts. I do believe that Christianity needs to be in politics, and I believe the reason the nation is in, the state is in, is now, is because not enough people believe that or get participation with it. Okay, the servants of the master, counting given. Do business till I come. Matthew 25, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came, and he settled accounts with them. At 1 Peter, we're reminded of our responsibility as each one has received a gift. There's not a person in this room has not received at least one gift from God. One gift, at least one. Most of you have numerous gifts from God. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. See, there, there we get that concept, that churchy concept, that Oh, 
I've got this gift, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do whatever I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do it in church. No, minister the gift to the world. Minister faith to the world. Minister healing to the world. Minister kindness to the world. Minister the gift to one another. As what? Good stewards. And manifold grace of God. Our talents, gifts, responsibilities, and authority don't end at that church door. We are to go into the world, ends of the world, the highways, the byways, the halls of government, schools, workplaces, and more using what God has given us to his glory, to the furtherment of his kingdom. Psalms 107, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You realize, of course, that I've read a number of articles in preparation for this that saying that Christianity is hate speech. And if you'll start looking at some of the posts and you'll start looking at some of the sites, there is a long listing of Christianity speech that is wanting to be outlawed because it's hate speech. They don't like it, so therefore they don't want to have to hear it. Run to your safe space, because I'm going to say it. God loves you. But I won't go there. I'm going to get into that. Friends of all, of all the nations on the earth, with the, perhaps the exception of Israel, we have been formed Founded, formed, and favored by God as a Christian nation. On February 29th, 1892, the Supreme Court declared in Holy Trinity versus the United States, that's the case, that the historical record of the America overwhelmingly demonstrated that the United States is a Christian nation. Three separate cases got as far as the Supreme Court, and, and each time the Supreme Court decided and declared that the United States is a Christian ma nation, no matter what President Barack Obama falsely stated. Joseph Story, Chief Joseph Story, is regarded as the father of American jurisprudence. And because of his fundamental influence upon the character of the Supreme Court, he left no doubt concerning the role of Christianity in the origin of America. I'm going to read you a bunch of things from different justices or st state justices. I could have filled up pay I could have filled up volumes. I just picked a few here. So, and and you can look them up. By the way, if you want any of the websites, um, I, I'll give you maybe in the next couple of weeks. I'll give you a bunch of websites where you can get the Constitution, where you can get the Magna Carta, where you can get the rights of the Englishman, where you can get all these different things that we're drawing from for material, if you're interested. If you're not, I'm not going to go to the work of tightening them all up. <laughs> and here's what he said, uh, no doubt concerning the role of Christianity in the origin of America. One of the things I'm trying to help you understand is America is designed – founded, favored by God. We are in a country that God is using to thwart the enemy of the world, Satan. He's using us, even though many of our rulers are not. And by the way, they're not our rulers. They're our representatives and it's we the people I needed that <laughs> one of the beautiful boasts of our municipal jurisprudence is that Christianity is part of the common law from which it seeks the sanction of its rights in which it endure, endeavors to regulate its doctrines. There never has been a period in which the common law did not recognize Christianity as laying at its foundation. The language of the Bill of Rights is remarkable for its pointed affirmation of the duty of the governors to support Christianity. This is a Supreme Court justice writing. Okay? So... Christianity as laying at its foundation. Our law comes out of the... We're going to see how that works out, by the way. 
one of the, one of the nights we're going to look at how the three separate points of government come from. We're going to look out where the Bible talks about having two witnesses, which you have to have for court. We're going to talk about the concept of having um, how you bring someone to court. So we'll, we'll, all of that's out of Scripture. Justice John McLean proclaimed that the moral life of a nation determined its degree of freedom, and the freest people were those who lived under the moral laws of Christianity. For many, people, for many years, my hope for the perpetuity of our institution has rested upon biblical morality and the general dissemination of Christian principles. This is an element which did not exist in the ancient republics. It is a basis on which we, on which free government may be maintained through all time. Our mission of freedom is not carried out by brute force, by canon, well that's church law, or by any other law except the moral law and those Christians' principles which are founded in Scripture. Justice Earl Warren, now some of you are old enough to remember who he was. And uh, though he was the president of the American Bible Sunday School Society for a long time, he did have sometimes a left leaning. And so I won't go in, I won't do it as bad things. At a prayer breakfast in February 54, attended then by President Eisenhower, the Vice President, the Chief Justice of the United States, cabinet members, congressmen and men and women, diplomats and businessmen, Chief Justice Warren affirmed the historic role of Christianity that is occupied in this nation's life, saying, I believe that no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have been from the beginning, been our guiding geniuses. Genesis. Whether, whether we look at the first charter of Virginia or the charter of New England or the charter of the Massachusetts Bay or to the fundamental orders of Connecticut, the object is present. The name, main object is present. A Christian land governed by Christian principles. I believe that the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge of our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it. Freedom, belief of expression, of assembly, of petition, the dignity of the individual, the sanctity of the home, equal justice under the law, and the reservations of the powers of the, or to the reservation of the power of the people. I believe that we are living today in the spirit of Christian religion. <coughs> I like also to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. Um, you, okay, I, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse, I think. But just one more for now. Justice David uh, Brewer, Josiah Brewer, wrote, by the way, he's the one that wrote the majority. Y you know, when Congress makes a decision, like they made a couple of decisions last week concerning uh, getting jabs. And so one one of the members on the team that carried has to write the decision. It's called writing the majority decision. And he wrote the majority decision on the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States. And by the way, that was 9-0. Every justice said, yes, this is a Christian nation. So after providing more than 80 pieces of evidence concerning America's Christian origin, Justice Brewer concluded in his decision, these and many mat other mat matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Why does this matter? Because it establishes the fact that this nation, whose very motto is in God we trust, that this nation, founded in principles and morals from the word of God, that this nation that we live in, that we are citizens of, which was established with God's help and blessing and has been for to now, sustained by his grace and mercy, is in danger of turning away from God and losing his blessing. Jeremiah 12, 17. 
But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it. This is the Lord's declaration. Folks, I'm calling for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm calling for Jehovah Witnesses. I'm calling for Nazarenes. By the way, we're all of those things, okay? Let's, let's get that right. You know, are you, are, you, uh, are you a Latter-day Saint? You bet I'm a Latter-day Saint. These are Latter-days, aren't they? And I'm a saint. Do I witness for Jehovah? You betcha I do. Well, the thing is that I'm calling for saints to say, look, we've been given a blessing in this nation, and we have a responsibility not only to pray for it, but to absolutely participate in the freedoms and the rights that God has allowed us to have while being a part of this nation. Amen? In the coming weeks, I hope to show you that the numerous examples of our rights and responsibilities, laws and privileges, whose principles were taken away, taken from God's word and incorporated into our nation's laws and fiber are being ero eroded by unscrupulous politicians, atheistic judges, and narcissistic special issue, special issue and interest groups. Just recently, our president said this. Put trust and faith in the government. He went on to say, and I, I, it's not fair for me to stop there. It's not fair for me to stop there. He went on to say, put trust and faith in the government to fulfill its most important function, which is to protect the American people. No, its most important function is to protect our rights and our liberties. You, you, you have, you, he has, if there's a war, he's got to protect that. But the, as we look at the Constitution and as we look at the Declaration of Independence and as we look at the Bill of Rights and the amendments and as we look at the Bible, we're going to see that our present state of government, local, state, and federal, are absolutely so far beyond the bounds it's unbelievable. And the only way it's going to change is if we pray and get up and do something about it. It's time the church get off the log. Again, I'm not talking pitchforks forks and torches. I'm talking planning and putting together a plan. And by the way, put trust and faith in the government. I, wanna, uh, I want to understand this. Job 8, 8. They're, they're, Job's being questioned. Why, why, is, why, why is this going ba so bad for you? Why, why is everything going for you bad? And he, they're just telling, hey, just re you know, repent. And Job says, no, no. For inquire now of the former generation. Pay attention to the findings of their ancestors. For we were born yesterday and do not have knowledge, since our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and speak to you and bring forth words from their understanding? That's what we're doing. We're going to go to the early writings of not only the founders of this nation, the founders of the laws of reason from God, the, found, the ones who gave us the natural rights of man, we're going to keep going back until we get into the scripture where it starts outlining what God expects from an individual. We need to understand that we have a generation growing up. I, I've been given a uh, audio tape of a college politics class. And I've listened to part of it. I'm astounded. Either the teacher is an outright, oh, I guess. See, you can't say those kind of words anymore. You can't say retard. <laughs> what was it? Mentally candy? I don't know. Anyway, whatever he is. Or he's a liar. 
because what I heard him say is an absolute lie. I, can, I, can, I, I want to sign up for the class and take my stuff in there and get thrown out and arrested. <laughs> but I don't have a toothache yet. I think we have a whole generation that doesn't realize the rights and responsibilities that are theirs. And I believe we need to stand up and help instruct them and show them how that we, in the power of God, can bring this nation back to what God has intended it. But we're not going to do it inside the walls of the church. We'll pray here. But then we're going to go out of here and do something about it. Amen? Instruct. These kids don't know. They haven't read what our forefathers wrote. There are thousands and thousands of pages on the proceedings of not just the Constitution, but the proceedings of the Bill of Rights, which took months. And by the way, the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights took the longest. Oh, another thing. Here's an interesting thing. Back in the 80s, America was getting very interested because there was a lot of lies and controversy, lies going on about the foundation of America. And so you used to be able to easily access in the 90s the historical notes. Well, then they took all the historical notes and shoved them in a deeper compartment. Now you've got to go a little bit more, and you've got to go through a lot more hoops to get to them. But I believe that's deliberate. I believe it's deliberate to keep right information out of the hands so they can keep people ignorant. Church, we should not be ignorant. We should be active. In the coming weeks, we will look at what our ancestors looked at and what their forefathers looked at and how all the historical documents which point back to God's words and principles have brought into being, have brought into being the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution with the Bill of Rights, which we are stewards of and will give an account for protecting. We are blessed by God to be in this nation. One of my favorite founding fathers was Patrick Henry. And by the way, if you go to church here, you know this. If you don't go to church here, here's something you don't know. When Patrick Henry rode, one if by sea, two if by land, what was he yelling? Don't tell me the Wadsworth song or the poem was written months after. He wasn't right yelling, the British are coming because they were all British. They identified as British. In their own writing, they identified as British. He was, I, he was yelling according to people who wrote down what he said when he passed, the regulators are coming. That's Paul Revere, excuse me, I'm talking about Patrick Henry. I like that story anyway. That was Paul Revere. It wasn't Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry is my favorite. Give me liberty or give me death. Thomas Jefferson talked about Patrick Henry speaking. Born again Christian. Tongue talking Christian, by the way. Said if on his deathbed, if my kids don't get anything from me, no matter what I live my, leave my kids, if, they, if I leave them with the faith of Jesus Christ, I've done my job. That's all I care about. You got to read some of the last will and testaments of a lot of these founders. They are faithful believers in Jesus Christ. So Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. He declared this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded the asylum, prosperity, and freedom to worship here. Finally, Patrick Henry gave us this warning. The Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It is an instrument for the people to restrain the government. Lest it come to dominate our lives and interests. The lest it, it is being referred to as the government. Put boundaries on the government. We need a time of education, edification, revival of our hearts, a return to God. We need a glimpse of the things to come. Amen? I, uh, yeah, 
we, we, we by the way, by the way, I won't ask this because I'll ask it, but you don't answer it. Please don't answer it. Have you ever got a ticket by a game warden for fishing, wrong size fish, anything else? You know what this says? This says only Congress shall make laws and shall not give them to other people to make. Do you think Congress made up the law that says a sturgeon in the Columbia River has to be longer than 30 inches and shorter than 44? Think of all the laws that are not passed by Congress. It says they're not, they're, they're to make, all the laws in the land must be made by these people. They are not allowed to regulate that authority of anybody else. Now, people that, every one of you, no, I don't know that. How many of you know somebody who is a, Put these things kindly. Why did I stretch my vocabulary? Uh, he's a nut job. He's not going to pay his taxes. He's not going to do this. He's not going to follow the laws because he's an independent nation unto himself because the United States Congress isn't uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. And we all know they're not supposed to. How many people know that? Joshua, you can raise your hand. Because I've talked to your brother. See, I know a lot of these people. Oh, no, no, Congress isn't doing their job. That's not how we win. We win by knowing the facts, praying, and then standing up and saying, you're out, you're out, you're out, and doing everything we can to get them voted out. And we don't back up. Having done all, stand. And again, if I go to jail, I get my teeth fixed, and I'm not going to show you how many I'm missing. See, the reality is that, that we don't want to be that person that just, oh, I, I, I knew people that just, oh, my goodness, uh, they, they, they weren't going to pay their taxes. They were independent nations. They were this. No, 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 no. We've got to do it as a group. We've got to do it in the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've got to do it with the right heart. We've got to do it with the right attitude. We've got we to make sure that what we're doing is led by God, not led out of frustration. Amen? And then when we go, we go as a group. And then we don't get picked off. I, um, okay, just give you an example. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm five minutes over, but we started five minutes late, so I guess I didn't count it. <laughs> <coughs> so that's why we're going to start at 15 tail next time. Um, if I was to ask you in here, this is the Declaration of Independence. This is what we forwarded it to King George. After four years of petitions, actually it was longer than that, and we're going to talk about why we have the Second Amendment, why we have these other amendments, because all our amendments, almost every single one of our amendments that we have, the first ten amendments, are all in here. They're all complaints, because all of our first ten amendments, nearly all of them, were part of the Englishman's Bill of Rights which King George just forgot about. Because King George fell back, like all the other kings seem to do, that it's a right of kings. It's not natural. It's not laws of nature or nature's God's entitlement to people. It's the king gets to decide. Now, don't pick on King George. King George was a nice guy. King George read and prayed every single day. King George was mad as a hatter. Why? Because King George had to wear wigs all the time. <laughs> now, that wasn't the problem. The problem was lice was a huge problem in England at that time. 
So what did they do with all of King George's wigs? They dunked them in mercury. So year after year, King George is putting on a wig of mercury. And by the way, that's where the expression, well, you know that's why the expression is mad as a hatter. Because hatters, the people that made these felt hats and silk hats, they use mercury. So that, see, now don't you just love coming here? All this information you never knew about. You couldn't have lived without it. Um, if I was to ask you very quickly, we'll finish up, I promise, for 100. Um, if I was to ask you, why did we, what is the number one reason that we declared here is why we're revolting? Why, by the way, we didn't revolt. We separated. We just wanted to separate. It comes a time to separate. We didn't declare war. You, you need to understand, this is not a declaration of war. This is the declaration that God has given unto us in naval rights. The natural rights. And those rights declare that man should be governed by people who they agree to. That they should not be held to this nobility rights of kings. How many of you learned in school that we, the, the cry rally of the Declaration of Independence was taxation without representation? Ever heard that? You've been lied to. It's only mentioned once. And then it's mentioned at number 17. By the way, how, how did that become? It came out of the fact that in the 1920s and 30s, you started having progressives. Um, we will call them communists who started to rewrite our history books. And they wanted to put something sublime as the reason. Let me just read you a few of things. If you ask citizens why Americans separated from great Britain, the overwhelming response is taxation without representation. Now, while it was one of the 27 grievances listed in the declarations of, Indi of independence, it is actually one of the absolute least. Listed in this declaration, 11 times more than taxation without representation is the abuse of governmental powers. Listed is the abuse of police and military powers, seven times more often used four times more often is the abuse of unjust judges and the judicial system. Taxation without representation is number 17 and only mentioned once. There are more mentions of interference with foreign trade. There are more mentions of immigration, suppression of information there's more mention of the fact that the government tried to control the firearms market. Now, you all know, and we'll get into this later, and I'll stop, I'll stop, stop, stop. You all know that one of the reasons, what is the reason? Uh, great people are born on great days. Okay? So whatever day you were born on, find out what great happened. My brother was born April 19th. That's a great day. That's the shot heard around the world. That started the American Revolution. But why did that start it? Because 10 years before, the government said, you can't have gunpowder or arms unless they have the king's seal on them and are sold by the king's company. You read about that in history books? It's there. You've got to find one before 1920, though. 